WDBO. How you doing today, Larry? We're doing fantastic, Josh. Nice to have you with us today. Hey, Thank you so much. Hey, it's 3 o'clock. Hi, folks. I'm Larry Perry, and you're tuned in to the Magic Mechanic Radio Show. Uh, so you new listeners know this is kind of an interactive automotive and mechanical advice program where we help you with your car problems and just about anything else. If it runs, you know, if it's got a motor or wheels or moves, <laughs> we can pretty much give you a hand with it. And it's been our pleasure to do so for over 31 years. We, Me personally, I'm a automotive shop owner. Owner, and I've been a master auto technician since 1982. Uh, to make the program work, well, we've got to get you folks busy. We need your calls, and the lines are open at 844-580-9326. And remember, all your calls and your car questions are going to be indexed and placed on our new Magic Mechanic YouTube channel. So other folks screening for answers like yours will be able to get the same needed information. Think about that. Uh, folks will be able to play back your car questions and hear our comments for many, many years from now. And so we, you, I guess we'll live in infamy, as they say. Uh, dash warning lights, port fuel economy, oil consumption, AC not working correctly. Uh, a lot of stuff about the newer AC systems. Uh, um, you know, if you got an AC problem, you got to take a car in to get it fixed. It wouldn't hurt for you to give us a ring because there's a lot of things that's changed with AC over the last few years that folks don't know about. Uh, and, and, and a lot of the repairs can be very, very affordable if you go in with your guns loaded, as they say. Uh, maybe you got a warranty question. Uh, you know, maybe you got a federal warranty question. A lot of folks don't know that you've actually got a couple different warranties on your car. One of them is from the manufacturer, and the other one is is enforced by the federal government when it comes to emissions warranties. Uh, things like catalytic converters and those sort of things have different warranties than your regular car warranty. Um, recall notice says maybe you get one in the mail. Maybe you want to know what it's uh, concerning. Um, you know, uh, antique, classic car problems. Uh, geez, I work on that stuff just about every day of my life. Um, gas, high hybrid, electrics, uh, diesel vehicles. Also remember I have a complete database that is filled uh, with all the listed recalls and technical safety bulletins and service bulletins from 1980 to present. And all you need to do is give us a call and remember for immediate help, well, I don't know exactly what Mr. J.D. Runner is doing today. Uh, he may be fishing, so he may not take your call immediately, but if you want to call the shop number and leave a message, he will call you back. And that is 407-629-2661. Uh, you can also ask a car question by emailing me, Larry at magicmechanic.com. Uh, also, I can't guarantee I will get to them during the, the show, but if I can't fit them in, I will answer it uh, by the first of the week. Uh, so go ahead and hop on board, uh, 844-580-WDBO, uh, and we'll sit and kick back and... Uh, talk about cars for the next couple hours and remember like I said all your car questions are going to be indexed and put on our new YouTube channel and you know you'll be able to go back and play that car question back anytime you want so if you didn't hear something like you thought you heard it you can always go back after a few days it takes a couple of days for our producer to get everything loaded up on YouTube but you'll have that uh, on there as a reference forever so you can't beat that and like I said this whole entire program the advice, the YouTube stuff. Hey, you can't beat the price. It's absolutely free. Hey, let's head up to Deltona and let's talk to Keith. He's got a 98 Ford pickup truck. Keith, tell us what's going on with this thing. Uh, yeah, I don't lie. Yeah, actually, I talked to you last week. Uh, it's, it's, it's slipping. If you go in reverse, um, back up and then go put it in drive, it takes a little while for it to go in the gear. You know, you, have, you rub the gas a little bit, it won't move, and then it'll, and then let off, it goes into gear. And then when it shifts in the in the uh, overdrive, it's slow shifting into overdrive too. It slips a little bit. But sometimes you have to let off the gas and then hit the gas, and then it'll shift into the overdrive. Keith, is this the original transmission in this '98 truck? Uh, uh, yes. 
All right. Now, now, did, did I ask you which transmission you had? Um, uh, yes, you did. What what and, transmission and is it? I have that information now. All right. What what <laughs> is it? It's a four R seventy five W. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, let me let me tell you what we ran into back then. Now now listen. This being as old as it is, we got to keep in mind, Keith. This thing could have some internal seal issue. Um, you know, rubber seals that seal the pistons that retain the fluid pressure. Uh, them, them seals are, you know, I, I mean, it, I wouldn't be surprised if they're worn and hard as a rock and may maybe yeah. getting close. Okay, I'm, I just, I'm not going to sit here and try to give you false hopes with something that you know. But, but let me tell you this: if if a person wanted to, and if they're real careful about going about doing this, if you pull the valve body down on that on that transmission with it still in the vehicle. Uh, uh, I, I did already. All right. Did you do you see where those caps are in there? Those servo caps. Yeah, the servos. Yeah, I, I did check those. You pulled them I, out. I didn't take them out. I didn't take them out, but but I looked. I knew they had an issue with the snap rings breaking on them. Well, it wasn't just that. See, a lot of them, a lot of those servos were made out of what we call bakelite. It's kind of like a plastic material instead of aluminum. And if you've got those old plastic uh, servo pistons in there, uh, Keith, I'm going to tell you point blank that those were public enemy number one. That's what caused most of the problems on that vintage transmission was that plastic, that bakelite would crack, and then your fluid it wouldn't retain fluid pressure. And the next thing you know, you got issues just like you're describing. When when you had you got to take the servo caps off in order to be able to get in there to look to see what kind of pistons are in in, in there. But but that's what you need to look at. You know, you might want to go one step further if you still got that valve body off, just to double check. If they're aluminum, I wouldn't worry about it. There's no sense in re- worrying about replacing them because you know th- th- they usually last a lifetime. But if they're the plastic ones, I'm going to tell you right now, it wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if if one of them had a crack in it. And when you you know when it's when it's meant to retain fluid pressure, it's not, and therefore you have this. Slippage issue, so you know I would take a look at that and see what see what you got. And if you if you have a plastic one there, pull it out, you know, and and look at it. And if it's not cracked, throw it back in. But like I said, the the best bet would be to do a line pressure test on that transmission and find out if you're losing line pressure, which I'm sure you are. And if you've got a, a servo piston that's cracked, you will as well. But you know that kind of lets you know if you've got aluminum pistons in there and you've got low line pressure uh keith i'm going to be honest with you my gut feeling is if you don't see a gasket blown on the valve body or something like that chances are the transmission's probably going to be coming out of your pickup truck and i appreciate your call but i wish you the absolute best have a great holiday weekend well let's head on up to altamont where charlie is dealing with some kind of issue with his ford explorer go ahead charlie yeah hi Larry. i've got a uh 03 expedition that I uh, don't use very much. Replaced the battery uh, about exactly a year ago and admittedly let it sit for about four months. Wouldn't start, had it jumped. I drove it around for a half an hour or so and the next day all I could get was uh, clicking when I put in the key. Jumped it up again, drove it around, had the same problem and so I'm just wondering why I'm uh, not able to drive the vehicle at this point. Well, if it runs and drives okay, right? Beautifully. Yeah, just good. The battery goes dead after it sets for a little bit. Uh, yeah, and uh, as long as it's uh, just a day or two or three later, I'm getting my current turnover once very weakly, and then I'm just getting clicking. Yeah. And if I jump it, it starts right up. Charlie, I have ran into this before, buddy. Uh, and, and and it wasn't on the expedition; it was on uh, the, the navigator, and they had the same type of system on some of them. Uh, let, let me tell you what will happen on these. Um, there is a relay, and and believe you me, we have. When I, when I say we've been to school on this one, there, there's several things that will cause a draw. Uh, you know, alternator can cause a draw. A relay in the uh, fuse and relay center can cause a draw. Uh, a lot of these things can pull juice out of the battery when the vehicle just sets stationary. 
But what we ran into on some expeditions, and I say some, not all of them, some expeditions and some navigators, Ford put this control module in the instrument cluster. Now, the instrument cluster will work absolutely teetotally fine, and you would never know that there was a problem with it. But it will cause it to pull every every drop of juice out of your battery when it sets. Um, I mean, the the extensive research that we had to go through in order to pinpoint this was absolutely incredible. Uh, just to find out that it was definitely the instrument cluster that was causing the problem. And then we ran into another problem, getting an instrument cluster. Uh, we, we probably had 10 sent to us, used ones, from salvage yards and all over the place. The problem with it was they were not equipped exactly like those very few instrument clusters that uh, Ford had conjured up back during that time. Why, why they put that one control module in some of them and not the other is beyond me. But, you know, that was what we've ran into uh, with 02, 03, and 04 expeditions and navigators. And it would usually start when one had to be jump-started or whether a battery had shorted out or after a battery replacement. That, that's when we would have the customers start coming in. They haven't done anything different to the vehicle, but all of a sudden they would start developing this severe battery drain. Um, what would probably need to be done in your case, Charlie, is um, we would have to go and find out where the draw is. And what we wound up doing on the last few, because we couldn't get parts to fix it with, we actually did a bypass. We actually bypassed the memory voltage going to the instrument cluster. So the only time that the instrument cluster would actually power up or get power to it is when you turn the key to the on position or when the engine was running. But if you turned it off, there was no memory going to that instrument cluster. And that's how we got rid of the drains on these things. And the folks could continue to use the vehicles. But, you know, when you, when you get into something like this, you're literally talking about re-engineering something in some cases but like I said we've already been through this <laughs> so so we're one step ahead of probably anybody else on the planet um, but it was a few of these not all of them it was really funny we would have salvage yards we would give them the exact same part number uh, for these instrument clusters when they would start pulling the juice out of the battery you know and we would get we get them in from the salvage yard the funniest thing was the one that came out of the vehicle weighed about two or three pounds more than the ones that they were sending us with the identical part number. And that's what threw up the red flags. We're like, why is this one so much heavier than this one, but yet they have the exact same part number? And what it was, there was a few expeditions and a few navigators where Ford and Lincoln, of course, at the time, were actually installing these control modules. And that, that one control module in there is what's causing the battery drain. And unfortunately, you, you can't, you, good luck on getting one of those. You want to talk about a needle in a haystack, but there's nothing wrong otherwise with the instrument cluster. That's why we decided just to do bypass surgery on it, get rid of the memory and have key on power only, and that fixed the problem. Now, in your case, we're going to have to actually diagnose it to pinpoint it to the instrument cluster, and that's as easy as pulling the instrument cluster out of the vehicle and let it sit out in the parking lot for four or five days and see if it still starts up. If it does, we know that we've tracked it down to the instrument cluster. It's just that simple. But getting the, the fix for it is usually a little bypass surgery, you know, from your local rocket scientist, I guess is the best way to put it. But you've got to draw. It'll have to be uh, diagnosed. And like I said, it wouldn't surprise me if it's going to be something associated with the instrument cluster, with what we have been through with the O2s, O3s, and O4 expeditions and navigators. You let us know if we can help you, Charlie. Thank you so much, Charlie. we got just about one minute left. Not sure that's enough time. Oh, i got a great one here. i got a great one. And oh, somebody, somebody out there in Radio Land may want to hear this. Listen, the 3.5 Echo Boost that are in the F-150 pickup trucks, if you need one, good luck. I mean, it, it's kind of like this. There's so many of those vehicles on the road, and Jasper is 
two or three months behind. Your local Ford dealer can't get them. Uh, salvage yards wants a gazillion dollars for ones that's got a zillion miles on them. We've got a 60,000 mile 3.5 Echo Boost for an F-150 down at the shop. It got 60K on it. Turbos, complete engine. Uh, it was a miracle that we got it. We had the opportunity to grab it, so we did because there is none of these engines. Um, so if somebody out there needs to repower a uh, F-150 for your fleet or your personal pickup truck, we've got one that is absolutely flawless. And I mean, it'd be a great replacement engine for somebody that needs one. Um, otherwise, like I said, these, these trucks are literally setting in uh, parking lots at dealerships and, and shops all over the place because you can't get the engines um, you know so it's not just a 3.5 echo boost there's other engines out here we're having issues with too we, we we're having a hard time getting them but we have the 3.5 twin turbo complete injectors coils plugs everything ready to go in an f-150 so if somebody needs one give us a holler at the shop and jd will get you priced out what gary you what do you got what do you got going on gary oh hey larry Hey, my wife has a 2018 Toyota Rav, and it's got the automatic transmission, of course. But she drives very little miles. Uh huh. So after five years, she ain't going to have 30,000 miles on it. it. Would it be a good idea to, can you just drain the transmission fluid and then replace without doing the filter and all that since you're doing it early? Yeah, I don't have any problem with that whatsoever, Gary. Um, and between me and you, I think that uh, every 30,000 mile fluid drain and fill on a transmission like that usually means lifetime transmission. Um, when, when, a, when a customer or a listener calls or, or emails me and they want a quote um, on a transmission service on a Toyota, um, you know, if it's a front-wheel drive, um, I quote it both ways, either for a drain and fill or for a pan drop and a filter, which adds a considerable cost to the to the operation. You know, and of course, we use the Amsoil synthetic fluid. Um, but in your case, the Toyotas they use a higher micron filter, and you know, it's a filter material that really doesn't deteriorate. Um, you know, it's it's pretty much a like a fiberglass woven. Uh, high micron. If it was a real low micron filter, you know, that uh, would, would pick up two microns, you know, a, a filter like that is really subjected to restriction and plugging up. But uh, unless you've got a severe transmission problem, you know, that's creating a lot of debris in a transmission, that would be the only time that a filter replacement would probably be warranted in a Toyota anyway. But you, you're not going to tell somebody with a new late model Tundra not to change their oil filter in their transmission. They're going to regardless. But for passenger car stuff, you know, just doing a drain and fill on it is is plenty's fine. Um, and, you know, that is a do-it-yourselfer type of job. Uh, if you don't have to go to the extreme of dropping the pan on it, you can drop the plug off out of the bottom of it. You can catch what's in there and actually measure the fluid that you're taking out. And, and just, you know, what on those, it's usually going to be a little over two quarts is what you're going to get out of the pan. But see, if you do that every 30,000 mile, that fluid is going to stay absolutely Absolutely clean as a pen. You will never ever have any debris in that fluid whatsoever. Um, but yeah, by all means, knock yourself out, drain and fill on that. You should be fine. And you know, the the every thirty thousand mile, I I just think that's a uh, the secret to success when it comes to the longevity of a Toyota transmission. Okay, perfect, Larry. Thank you. All right. Have a great weekend. Let's head on over to, well, let's stay in Orlando, where Damon's got a question. Go ahead, Damon. Good morning, or good afternoon, guys. Hey, I am looking to potentially purchase um, a 2016 Trax. Uh, it's got about 102,000 miles on it. Uh, looks like, from what I can tell, it's had three owners, but they've taken, seems like they've taken pretty decent care of it based on what records I could find through Carfax. Well, I wanted to see if you had any suggestions on what to look for for that make and model uh, in your, uh, as far as any pitfalls or any suggestions uh, about what I should look for 
before I signed the dotted line. Yeah. Um, Damon, there's a few things that kind of come to, to mind on that car. Um, they've used that engine, that little 1 4 motor, and uh, the Chevy Cruze, and of course the tracks, and uh, uh, one or two other applications. So that motor's been around a little bit. Um, believe it or not, that's another engine that is almost impossible to find. Uh, they are they are such a hot item right now. You ca you can't hardly find them. Uh, they are you know, salvage yards don't have any. Uh, you you can't hardly find them. So you definitely want to take care of the one that's in the car if you buy the car. Uh, there's a couple things that comes to mind. One of them is the current case ventilation system on those engines. Um, you know they're they're starting instead of using just an old conventional type of PCV valve, which you know alleviates the crankcase of, of of pressure. What they're using is this uh, diaphragm in the valve cover itself, and when those things go bad, uh, vacuum will literally start sucking the engine oil right out of your motor. And anybody that has one of those really needs to keep a check on their oil level um, because this can happen at any time. You, you just don't know. So the, the crankcase vent system on those does go bad on occasion. And when it does, uh, the way that system is made, it can literally pull the oil right out of the engine. Uh, so you need to make sure you keep a good check on it. And having 100,000 mile on it, and we're talking about a car that's you know, six years old, that would be something that, if it was mine, I might go ahead and replace that as a warranty situation. Um, or, I mean, just as a maintenance situation. I don't know I'm talking about warranty. Ain't no warranty on a 100,000 mile car. Uh, unless you buy an extended warranty, which you may want to consider that as well. Um, that is the one thing that does come to mind. The other is everything cooling system wise and it's just not on that car the reason I'm bringing it up because of it being on that car is because that's why these things usually need engines and let me explain the I don't care whether it's the radiator hose that goes to the engine or a bypass hose everything that they connect to is made out of stinking plastic and the plastic will get hard and brittle and and will start decaying and the next thing you know you're driving down the road you have go no problem whatsoever and a stinking radiator hose will just break right off of the engine and if a person's not staying on top of it they're even going to overheat the motor and not even know why it overheated and it's usually because something like a big plastic um, housing just broke off of the car it is so common, and that's what's taking engines out nowadays, is overheating because of all these plastic fittings and adapters that go onto the engine. I don't know why they want to make them out of plastic, but that's how they're coming from the manufacturer. I'll just tell you how to fix them. I don't invent the stuff, folks. But that those are things on a 100,000-mile car I would be concerned with. And, 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 you know, the crankcase vent system on that one, uh, the hoses and all the plastic cooling system, uh, fittings and things like that they're not real expensive uh, but they can cause some expensive problems so th those are the sort of things Damon that I would be concerned with uh, other than you know of course you buy a car like that the first thing you're going to want to do is switch it all over to Amsoil uh, engine transmission you know you're going to make sure that you're not going to be buying the major things because of la a lousy lubrication you, you know you put the Amsoil in it and that's going to alleviate that issue of it but you got to make sure we don't overheat it and we don't suck all the whole out of the motor because of the crankcase vet system design that they use on that car. But, but you know, other than a couple recalls, which they've probably already been done on this vehicle, you know, for the price range that you're looking at, um, you know, it's probably just about as good as anything else out there. Uh, you, you know, it's just used cars are expensive right now. Um, and uh, the biggest thing is, is I know that there's some things that should be considered to be done, not only if it would be a Chevy Trax, but, but almost any car because of the amount of plastic that they're using nowadays to, you know, for the cooling system. Uh, I guess it just saves them a lot of money to make it out of plastic. 
plastic as opposed to aluminum or steel, but, but these are things that the consumers have got to really take into consideration. It, it's kind of like this. What's the point of me as a mechanic telling you, you know, okay, your car's 10 years old, you really should consider replacing your radiator and heater hoses. If we leave all this plastic in there that's the same age and can break right slap in two any day you get into the car, you almost have to replace these plastic thermostat housings and, and stuff like that. Or some of the radiator hose systems on these vehicles are so complex, they'll have one big hose and then they'll have a plastic fitting and then they'll have three other hoses coming off of it. It's bizarre, crazy looking things. They look like triantulas. But there's so many plastic pieces that connect this all together and that's what fails it's rarely a hose it's usually one of the plastic fittings and that's and then folks you know you got kids driving these cars and stuff and they drive them until they stop when they overheat they don't know any better <laughs> you better teach them better and get expensive but but that's what's actually taking place and happening in the industry is these plastic uh, thermostat housings and fittings those things are breaking they snap off people overheat the engines and they get overheated so bad that you Usually there's no salvaging the engine, so but that's the reason there's a shortage of a lot of engines out here. But in your case, Damon, if it's got a decent looking Carfax, you may ha want to have somebody just take a look at it. But me personally, I would tell you like this: if you were to get everything all done up on that car to try to get another honest hundred thousand mile on it without it breaking the bank, cooling system, AMS oil, uh, make sure that crankcase vent system is up to par maybe give it a good old-fashioned tune-up and you know what that's really about all you can do uh, as far as you know it being a great car or a bad car it, it, it it's it's right in the middle of about anything else that's out there that same type of uh, vehicle and same size i appreciate your call and wish you have a great weekend let's head on up to oviedo where al is calling in go ahead al hello Ray. Hey. hey i got a uh, two thousand I have a 2003 Ford Explorer Sport Track with 150,000 miles on it. So recently it just stopped and it would not shift into gear. So we had the automatic transmission replaced with a rebuilt unit that was guaranteed for three years. Now, three months later and 500 miles later, the overdrive light came on and we discovered the transmission fluid turned to a strawberry milkshake. We now, the repair shop is going to flush the transmission and change the radiator. The question is, is there any damage to the contact with the antifreeze on the new unit? And shouldn't we replace the newly rebuilt unit with another? Or is that down the road? Well, the transmission shop isn't going to replace the transmission under warranty because of a bad transmission cooler. So... Unfortunately, um, you know, that's, that, that won't be, you know, covered. It's really about the only thing that we can hope for is to flush, you know, put a radiator in it with a new tranny cooler and go ahead and um, run several doses of, of new fluid through the transmission and try to get it cleaned up and, and, and see what happens. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that I could really... Um, you know, it, it, did the, did the, did the shop that did the transmission did they replace the radiator at the same time? No, that's that was my biggest concern, and that's just common sense, right? So, well, not necessarily, Al. You know, it, it's kind of like this. I'm not going to sell somebody something that I don't see any reason to, to sell them. You know, so it, it's kind of like this. It's one of them situations to where when, anytime we replace a transmission, the, the one thing that my guys will tell you point blank that I make them all do is flush the lines and the cooler in the radiator itself. Um, if, if they don't, uh, you know, we have no way of knowing if that cooler is open and doing its job. Uh, it could be restricted. Uh, but if you, if you blow high-pressure cleaner through that cooler, it will let you know if it's plugged up, restricted, uh, you know, but you have to make sure there's no debris in it or it's going to wind up back in a new transmission and take a transmission out. But if, if there's no problem found when you're doing that, you know, it would be, I, I, I wouldn't want to sell you a radiator just because, you know, a, a, a transmission cooler going bad in a radiator is 
I mean, it happens. It, it's something that we see quite often, you know, on, on older, higher mileage cars. But it's not something that I would sit there and automatically say, we're going to sell you this because we're putting a transmission in your vehicle. You know, so I'm not going to fault the shop for that. You know, I'm sure they feel bad enough over it already. Um, you know, sometimes it's just coincidences that, you know, <laughs> makes makes a shop owner just scratch his head and wonder why he's doing this for a living. But in a case like this, I would I would let them go ahead, flush it, you know, run several uh, doses of new fluid through it, try to get the strawberry milkshake out of there, uh, take it and drive it, and hopefully it didn't really hurt anything, you know. Sometimes it won't, you know, if, if it's caught soon enough um, and and then we just kind of cross our fingers and hope for the best Al but but as far as trying to blame the shop I, I just it wouldn't be fair to them to do that you know it, it's it's like this I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to sell you a new set of tires on a maybe you know if they all look good and I don't see anything wrong with them I wouldn't want to sell you tires either you know but it's it's kind of the same thing you know you wouldn't want to sell somebody a radiator if if the one that's in there is not leaking there's no signs of it leaking coolant and at the time you did the transmission you didn't see any signs of coolant in the transmission fluid you know it would it would it, it's just one of them situations to where you know things last so long and and then stuff just happens as they say but I, I don't think we could really fault the the shop that that did the work on it and uh, hopefully they're good folks they'll try to help you with this and, and see what happens um, but I appreciate your call and sharing this with us and uh, we we hope you have a great weekend. We got 90 seconds, Larry. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I want to touch base on something here, and, and we really did not know how big of a problem this was until here, just the last few weeks. If you've got a newer, later model uh, Chevy pickup truck, uh, let's say somewhere around a 16 and up, uh, especially, and they've got the limited slip locker type of rear end in them, it is imperative that you get that fluid out of those differentials and get you some AMSOIL fluid in there yesterday. Uh, it, 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 they are dying left and right, and nobody's got parts for them. They're all on national back order, and guess what? They're so bad and they're so defective, Jasper won't even rebuild them. Same thing with the GM 8-speed transmissions. If you don't have AMSOIL in them, you better put it in them. I'm just telling you point blank. Uh, the new GM 8-speed transmissions, Jasper says, we're not even going to rebuild them. They are, we can't warranty them. They're just engineered that horribly. And the parts that they're made out of. It, 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 and that's pretty bad when you get a big manufacturer like Jasper that says, listen, the stuff's so bad, we can't rebuild it to resell it because we can't warranty it? Are you kidding me? But on the rear ends, they've got a little and I'm literally rubbing against daggone cast metal and what's going to happen is you got a basically a sacrificial rear end so if you don't have a great lubricant in there you're just going to be waiting and boy is it going to be expensive but on the later model GM trucks make sure and even the Camaros any of the rear wheel drives they're using that 12 bolt limited slip locker rear end you got to replace the fluid. The Colorados, the Canyons, the GMC Denali's, um, all these vehicles. You got to get that factory gear lube out of those differentials. Get AMSOIL in them, for goodness' sake. Same thing with the eight-speed automatic transmissions. If you don't, it's going to cost you a fortune, and you may not even be able to get the parts to fix it with. So, take that to the bank. Hey, welcome to the second hour of the Magic Mechanic Radio Show. It's a show where you call in, you ask your automotive question, and, well, we don't send you a bill. You can't beat the price because it's free. That number is 844-580-WDBO. We also take your automotive questions and my comments, and we place them on our new YouTube channel. You know, it's really kind of... Um, uh, new thing for me, you know, because I'm not used to people actually being able to see me do the radio show. So I've told all my friends, I said, you know, the biggest thing is to make sure you don't pick your nose and you don't do anything stupid while you're being recorded, you know, because that, that could really put a damper on things, you know. And we do the YouTube channel thing now so that other folks may be able to find the same help for the same type of issue. You'd be surprised. You know, you get a problem with a car 
And, you know, there's hundreds of other people out there with that same identical vehicle and probably have the same identical problem. So that's that's where the YouTube thing comes in. I think that will actually be able to help a lot of people on a continual basis. And plus, you'll be able to play back your car question anytime you want. You know, but the the producer for the YouTube channel he he gets them usually loaded up by Tuesday or Wednesday of the week, so it takes him a couple of days to get everything all edited and and lined up. But it's really pretty cool. A lot of folks find it useful. I've had a lot of favorable content, you know, a lot of favorable comments on on the YouTube channel. So we hope it helps folks. And see, it's not just me. I couldn't do it without you. So, you know, take advantage of it, and maybe we'll all help a few folks with their cars. How's that? Plus, you can, like I said, you can play it back anytime you want. A number to get in touch with us is 844-580-WDBO. And to speak to J.D. at the Magic Mechanic Shop, I don't know. He might be out fishing today. Goodness gracious, it's Labor Day weekend. Goodness gracious, I don't, I don't know what he's doing. I doubt he's laying around. It ain't raining, so he's probably fishing. But if you do need to call the shop, you can just give us a ring at 407-629-2661, and you can leave a message, and then J.D. will get back in touch with you. Folks, our sponsors are very important to the show. We all pitch in to bring you the program every week. So if you enjoy it, please try to patronize our sponsors and tell them you heard about them here on the Magic Mechanic Radio Show. Orlando Auto Upholstery. Interior, convertible tops, carpet seats, cars, trucks, vans, SUVs, boats, any type of uh, interior. Maybe you're in the middle of an antique car restoration or an old classic muscle car uh, and you're going to do the seats and maybe you've got a cracked up dashboard and you're trying to figure out what you're going to do with it. Well, you know, these guys are magicians when it comes to, you know, leather and stitching and that sort of thing. They can build just about anything. Door panels. I mean, they can put whatever the factory came with the absolute shame. Uh, so they're really artists and this is an artesian type of trade is what we consider it. Uh, anybody that can sew and make things like this are incredible and they're rare nowadays. <coughs> Excuse me. Visit OrlandoAutoUpholstery.com or call them at 407-898-2351. And, of course, Amsoil, synthetic lubricants for your car, truck, van, SUV, boat, motorcycle, tractor, bulldozer, semi, you name it, Amsoil makes a lubricant for it. Bottom line is, you want an oil that is attracted and runs to heat and friction as opposed to getting hot and thin and running away from it. That's the secret that Amsoil does that other oils do not do. Uh, if you want an engine and transmission to last you the life of the vehicle you you you, you got to switch to amsoil um, you know it's kind of like this if you can run a lubricant in a in a major component like an engine and transmission and you don't have to buy those during the course of the life of that vehicle the, the other stuff, literally, it's little stuff. It's small stuff. Tires, brakes, I mean, stuff like that. It don't matter any kind of vehicle. You're going to have those types of things that goes along with ownership. An occasional power window that quits working, air conditioning that conks out on you. That's going to happen on all vehicles. But if you can avoid the big one, the engines and transmissions, it makes that vehicle so cheap to own during its life cycle and the time that you have it. Uh, so do your own research. You can go to amsoil.com, uh, or you can just take my word for it, either one. But if you're not running Amsoil, you're not running the best lubricants in your car, period. Jasper engines and transmissions. If you need a motor or transmission, Jaspers come with a 100,000-mile nationwide warranty. You get one installed, you repower a vehicle, you've got a 100,000-mile nationwide warranty. That is parts and labor. You don't have to worry about something happening and somebody trying to weasel out of fixing what you've already paid for. That's the reason that we sell the Jaspers. You know, I, there's a lot of remanufacturers out there, but hey, you, you get something warranted from them. Good luck. Jaspers been around since 1942. Uh, so they've been around a long time. They've got an impeccable reputation, and they do stand behind their products. And, of course, last but not least, the Magic Mechanic Auto Service Center, located in Orlando, Florida. Engines, transmissions, brakes, suspension, steering, electrical repairs, and, of course, 
AMS Oil Synthetic Lubricants. You can visit us at magicmechanic.com. Email me directly with your automotive estimates, your quotes, um, or car questions. Larry at magicmechanic.com. Let's head to what well, we're going to be in Orlando here. Let's talk to John. He's got an 18 Nissan Frontier. He's been holding a long time. Thank you for hanging on, John. Tell me what's going on with this vehicle. Well, when I fill it up, I got a pop inside. You know how you put your finger in your mouth and you pop your cheek? That's the exact sound I got coming from the gas, you know, where you put the gas in it. Uh huh. Yeah. I don't know what's going on with that. Now, do you do you hear any pressure or anything when you take the cap off? No, no pressure at all. Just you know, it's not the gargling; it's the popping sound. Now, whenever you're filling it, does it take the fuel quickly, or do you have to reduce the flow to keep it from kicking the pump off? Nope, nope, full blast. Hmm. And you don't have any check engine lights on or anything like that. No. You know. No, no. I, I, I got to look and see. I, it doesn't do it. I think it's just when I fill it. But yeah. it, it, I mean, I've been running it for two days now, and it's uh, it's just still doing it. You hear the popping sound even when you're not filling it. Mm, no, no. It's after I fill it, and not while I'm filling it. It's after I fill it, and then run it. And then when, yeah. So after you fill the vehicle up, you put the gas cap on, or is that a non-cap system? What's that? Is that a, do you have to remove a, a gas cap, or is that a non? Yes. yes. Okay. You, no, you, no, you have to remove that gas cap. Okay. And then when you're driving it, you're actually hearing the popping noise. No. It's after you get out of the vehicle and exit it, you hear the popping noise? Well, it's, yeah, it's, I blow down the window. Because I switch me and my wife switch their cars around, so when I get out, I can hear it because I leave my truck running. Okay. And you think it's coming from the gas tank? Yeah. Well, there's, I guess, you know, see, your fuel tank, well, you say you don't ever hear any pressure coming out of it, so I can't imagine it actually alleviating excessive pressure in the tank. Um, John, this is with the vehicle off, correct? When I turn it off, it stops. When you turn the engine off, it stops. Yes. You know what? There, I I don't know what to say in this particular instance, and, and that's a rarity for me. But but let me tell you what I would do. Um, I think well, you're in Orlando. Um, why don't you bring it by the shop one day? And uh, just give JD a call and find out when we when we've got the alignment rack open. And let's let's take and put that car up on the alignment rack, raise it up in the air, shut it off, and let's stand underneath the vehicle and listen for this sound. Okay. How's that sound? I, because, I mean, I don't know whether it's something in the exhaust system or something around the gas tank or exactly what it is. But, but like I right. said, I, I, I don't know of really how else to address this, John. I really honestly don't. Um, I know. I never heard it before. You know, it's, yeah, I've never heard that. Yeah, something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, there's so many things going through my head right now. Does it have rear AC on it? No. Okay. Yeah, see, that's something else that could cause an issue. But that, you, you know, that's ex excluding that. And I, I really, I can't think of anything in the fuel system that would actually create a popping noise like that. 
Um, you know, but, but you would be surprised, John. Sometimes an exhaust system can make some of the darndest noises ever was as soon as they start changing temperature. Um, I, I don't know why. You know, I'm not a metallurgist, but um, you know, it's it's just sometimes they when they start changing temperature and start cooling down a little bit or whatever, they can make some of the pinging, pinging, popping type of noises. You got to remember, you got a catalytic converter that's underneath the vehicle more than one on that car and the, we're talking about parts that are getting up to 900 degrees in some cases so when they start cooling off they can make some crazy 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 noises now on this frontier you got the three five motor in it no it's uh, the four is it the four three or four six Okay. All right. All right. And I'm just checking. There was a couple things there that I was going to point out to you if you had the three five in it. But um, yeah. Let uh, when you get a chance, let's let's j just give the shop a call. Find out one day, maybe in the afternoon, we're not covered up with oil changes or whatever, and find out when you can just swing it by and and you wait on it. We'll pull up on the alignment rack, raise it up, shut it off after it's good and hot, and we'll just stand underneath there and listen to see what the heck's going on with it. John, I appreciate your call, especially holding on as long as you did I, I hope i give you a little help or guidance there but you know we'll, we'll try to locate that popping noise and at least find out what it is because sure as the world we're gonna have somebody else call us with the same identical issue you have a great weekend what can we do for you russ i have a 2010 chrysler sebring uh, power hard top convertible that the windows are going crazy they don't index you know it's supposed to drop down a little bit when the top comes down and come mm -hmm. back up when you open and shut the door etc mm -hmm. but they're not doing that they're doing it erratically when they want to etc <laughs> oh wow then there's a control module on those that actually if i remember right you've got two switches for to, to let the top down, right? Uh, no, it's just one switch. Just the one. I thought that some, yeah. some of them I thought had two. Um, but when you hit the switch to drop it down, and of course what it does is it tells the windows to, to lower, and then um, mm -hmm. then, it, then of course the top will go ahead and, and, and slide back, um, and then it'll, it'll come on down and park. But there's, if the windows are not going to the right location, uh, now is it just one or two windows, or are they all going? Are they all doing the same? No, when you, when you put the top down, everything seems to work properly. They go down, the top goes down. When you put the top up, they go up. The top go, uh, uh, the top goes up. The windows go up. So that's fine. But what happens is, like when you go to get out of the car, they, they drop down about a quarter of an inch, and you get out. And then they're supposed to stay down until you shut the door and go back up a quarter of an inch. But they they uh, will drop down when you open the door, but then they go right back up. So the the door won't shut because they're they're not indexed down. Um, and that's only on the front windows on both doors. It's it's happening. Uh, now, if you pull the door handle out, they'll drop down. You can keep that door handle out, get it shut, and then let the door handle go in, and it finishes coming up like it's supposed to. But it doesn't do it automatically like it's supposed okay. to. It's something's yeah. Crazy. Um, have you have you replaced the battery or something in the car lately? Uh, yes, and it was doing it before we replaced the battery too. Okay. All right. Now on that one, I would have to look and see what the procedure is for to program those windows. But there is a programming procedure for that. Um, it's the same okay. way on uh, Mustangs and uh, Corvettes and everything else. Uh, a lot of BMWs. You yeah. have to program the 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 windows so they drop and then they go back up into the seal like they're supposed to. Um, I'll tell you what you can do. You can email me, Larry, at magicmechanic.com, and I'll look up the program procedure for that and see if it's something that you can do yourself. Um, I, I believe okay. it's, it, yeah, it's, it's, there's, there's usually a combination of a couple things that you've got to do on those windows. Uh, we just did one on a Mustang here. I think it was last week. But the, the procedures to program those windows are different on every one of these cars. 
So there's nothing exactly the same from Chrysler to Ford to whatever. And all cars do not do this, you know. But any of them that have windows that actually go up, well, considerably up into the door seal, they all drop down when you open them and then close back up whenever you go to do it. But it's just, I don't think there's anything wrong with the car. I just think that it needs to be, they, they need to be programmed. They've lost their programming there for some reason. And I know that if a battery stays disconnected for any length of time, that it will lose its programming and they will have to be programmed. Russ, email me, Larry, at magicmechanic.com. I'll try to get you that information and then I'll see if you can do it yourself. If not, we'll have you swing by the shop and we'll take care of it for you. All right, this one comes to us from, well, you'll see, Dean. Hey, Larry, this is Dean from the Villages. We have a 2015 Mercedes GLA. And earlier in the show, a guy with the RAV4 um, with low mileage was calling you to see if he should have a drain and fill transmission fluid. And I'm asking the same question. Uh, does all the fluid come out of a seven-speed dual-clutch transmission? Uh, because I'm thinking of having a drain and fill done at 35,000 miles. Thank you. Yeah, there's there's no problem with doing that whatsoever. Um, you know, I, I personally have a vehicle with a dual clutch in it, and I, uh, you know, I, I changed the fluid in it because it's a max duty uh, transmission. Um, but I'll I'll change it whenever it hits fifteen thousand mile, uh, and I'm just going to change the fluid in it. You know, you got to remember on a vehicle like that. Um, on yours, I think the entire transmission pan gets replaced whenever you replace the filter on that one. Um, so I I would have to look it up to be 100% sure, but I think the filter is actually integrated into the pan. Now, as far as removing the fluid from the pan, uh, you'll have to see if there's an access to actually drain it or not. If you can drain it, um, you know, and then you'll have to come up with a device to actually fill it back up. But, um, you know, if, if, if you can't, if you don't have a drain plug, you'll actually have to put something into the fill and actually vacuum the fluid out of the pan uh, if you don't replace the pan and filter assembly itself. So, uh, with that being said, if it's got a drain plug, go for it. Uh, if, if it doesn't, it may be more of a, a chore to extract the fluid that's in there than it's worth. So, but uh, if you want some more particulars on it, and I can give you more information, Larry at MagicMechanic.com, and I'll research it and see just exactly what you're up against, and if it does have a drain plug or not. Thank you so much, Dean. And this one comes to us from a familiar voice. He's got more of an observation followed by a question that has nothing to do with cars. Hey, Larry, this is Dean again from the Villages. I uh, just want to let you know that I've been looking on uh, your YouTube TV channel, and I subscribe free. And I really enjoy uh, looking at uh, several of the um, of the pieces of your show. I was just wondering... Uh, is it possible for you to go live on YouTube TV so we can see you? And love the room that you're in, by the way. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate your show. <laughs> well, I appreciate the vote of confidence there. Um, yeah, actually, the room is my office here at my house. Um, so it's, well, what can I say? It's a pretty cool office, right? <laughs> Hey, we will uh, we will check with Logan. Uh, he's the gentleman that does all the YouTube stuff. He he's got so much planned for this show, um, and, and he's so helpful. Uh, he's going to look into you know he's got to put the sideboards on the the program uh, so that you can go into different uh, YouTube videos without having to put in a search and um, we'll ask him about the live TV thing uh, you know it, it might be a situation to where we can we can uh, we can do that I, I know that you can do the live TV uh, live YouTube thing so we'll have him look into it and I'll let you know as uh, maybe next week or something on the program here and see what we come up with but I appreciate your open mic Hope you guys enjoyed that double dose of Dean. Let's go back to the phones where Wayne is calling from Winter Garden. Go ahead, Wayne. Uh, good afternoon. Um, now, I've got a 2012 Cadillac SRS that I've been having some early work done on, and they indicated that my battery is leaking, I need to replace that, as well as the terminal cables. And 
I just wanted to know, is that something that do, the chapter could do, or should I leave it to the professionals? Well, uh, Wayne, it's kind of like this. Um, when it comes to battery terminals nowadays, a lot of them are integrated into the wiring harnesses. Uh, it, it's not like the old days, you know, you could just cut the end off and put a put an end on it. But now we do have um, some pretty sophisticated repair terminals that we use nowadays. See, a lot of the battery terminals that go to your battery posts are they actually have sensors in them that can tell the car if there is a low voltage situation with the battery. Uh, so a lot of cars can actually diagnose a, a battery going bad before it goes completely bad. And so we're talking about something a whole lot more sophisticated than just an old lead <laughs> battery terminal like they used years ago. Um, but you know, a lot of those can be replaced, but in order to do it, um, like I said, you would have to probably take a uh, an eyelet, uh, you know, a, a terminal end, and, and cut your old one off and put an eyelet on there to where it's something that you could physically bolt to a new terminal assembly itself. And the reason that I bring that up is is because some of these cars, if you don't do that, you got to replace pretty much the wiring harness to replace a battery cable. And, you know, I mean, this could run into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars over a bad connect, you know, over a bad connection situation. And uh, that's the reason that most of them can be, if they're long enough, most of them can be repaired. Uh, but they've got to be repaired in a correct manner or the computer system of the vehicle will pick up that, you know, the battery sensor's not there no more. Um, and usually these battery terminals and stuff like that, they deteriorate and they, and they start, you know, going bad because of a battery leaking acid out of it. So anytime you see, you know, corrosion actually uh, starting and, and being created on a battery terminal, th that's due to a battery leaking acid out of it. It's no longer sealed properly. So when you, when you, we get that acid starting to seep out of the battery, it'll eat a terminal completely up. And like I said, the downside is is the the wiring harness that it's connected to. Um, and a lot of the dealers see th they don't they don't fix stuff you know i mean i don't i don't mean that in a bad way but they don't fix anything they, they replace stuff you know so instead of you know somebody coming in there and spending a little bit of time on repairing a, a battery terminal in of course you're going to get a, a price quote for a a wiring harness and you know so the difference between that is you know 150 bucks versus two thousand dollars for a battery terminal so th those are the types of things that happen between independent shops and your local dealers so you know independents fix stuff you know lots of stuff dealers replace everything if it needs another one they're going to replace it they, they rarely do any internal engine work they replace every, it, it could be anything inside of a motor they're going to replace it you're going to get a price on replacing it as opposed to new time and chain gears and water pump like we do on three five you know front wheel drive ford engines every every day of our life you know where a, a dealer will wind up wanting to replace the whole entire engine and it's not cost effective so customer decides not to fix the car we don't want people to do that. We want them to fix their car. So we, we fix stuff <laughs> is basically how it turns out. Hey, Wayne, listen, it, if, 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 if it looks like it's something that you can do yourself, have at it. Uh, just make sure it's done in a professional manner and, and safe, and uh, you shouldn't have any problems with it. If it's something that looks like it can be challenging because it's got so many wires going to it, well, it could still be fixed without replacing a whole entire harness, but you might want to give us a holler at Magic Mechanic. I appreciate your call, and I appreciate you holding on. Have a great weekend. Thank you much, Wayne. That opens up a line, but we might be running close to the end of the show while Matt, Gary, and Jim are waiting on hold. Thank you so much, gentlemen. We'll be coming to you after this break here on The Magic Mechanic, where your chance to get your car or truck question answered right here on WDBO. Uh, Gary, who's hanging out in St. Cloud. How are you doing today, Gary? Good. Thank you very much. Uh, Larry, I need some help. I got a 2011 Hyundai Santa Fe. Uh, I replaced uh, the two strip front struts and the two lower control arms because uh, it's got over 160,000 miles on it. 
and uh, did it myself, and the dang thing rattles like there's yeah, you know, like they're all loose. Uh, uh, can you give me an idea what I should look for or what I should do? Now, when you when you replace those front struts, did you um, did you use loaded struts? Yes. That has the okay. If if they've got the mounts on them and the strut, and you replace both the lower control arms, right, with the ball joints. I. Yes. Okay. Well, we still have a few things there. Um, the the sway bar links. Did you replace those while you were in there? I did not. Yeah. That that's public enemy number one. Uh, those those can make all kinds of noises. Um, you know, and a lot of times you can't hardly tell by just looking at them. Uh, and when they get loose, every time you go over a bump or a rough road, you're going to hear that rattle, 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 uh, and it'll drive you absolutely crazy. But, uh, yeah, you, if you've got the lower control arms done and you've got the uh, uh, loaded struts put in there, uh, those, those mounts should be fine. I would say uh, just get you a set of uh, 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 sway bar links. Uh, they're not that expensive. If you've done this other work on it, then that's going to be a piece of cake. A lot easier than replacing a strut. So just replace the, the, the links on it. Look at the bushings, too. Sometimes they're a little hard to get to to see um, because on that vehicle, I think they're mounted up behind, kind of around where your steering rack is. Um, I don't think that a tie rod in uh, inner or outer Outer is going to cause the you know the the noise that you're hearing. I think most of it's probably going to be due to the to the sway bar links. They're cheap, and if you've already done this other work, this is going to be a piece of cake. Let us know how it turns out. Thank you so much, Gary. Let's head on up to Orlando, where Matt's been holding. Go ahead, Matt. Hi, Gary. Uh, I wanted to find out if there was uh, um, an oil from my 2008. BMW M3 that ends oil mix. The, the fact is calling for a MW60. Yeah. Uh, Matt, you know, in this particular case, Amsoil does not make a 10W60 for that application. Uh, very, very, very few vehicles used a 10W60, as you probably know. Um, and yeah. I'm in a situation to where, you know, I am a viscosity beast. I love viscosity. You'll hear me increase viscosities on 99% of the recommendations that when people call me up and they ask what oil should I use in my vehicle, but you're never, ever going to hear me lower viscosities. Uh, it, you know, a 2050 AMS oil dominator race oil would probably work fine in your application, but I'm going to tell you right now, this is this is a rare for a rarity for me, and anybody that listens to this program is going to know that I I bleed AMS oil. You know, I don't think that there's a better oil made on this planet. I really honestly don't, and it's because it uses a poly alpha orphan base stock with ester. Now, where else are you going to get a poly alpha olfin base stock with ester without it being a hydro crack petroleum oil like everybody in the planet has? The only people that really make that oil is Redline. And yeah. I'm going to tell you like this. You know, I think if I was you, if, if I owned that car... You know, and I hate to say this. I mean, all my Amsoil fans are just like, Larry, what is wrong with you? But seriously, this is one of the rare occasions. You got me. I, I would probably get the 10W60 red line, and I would just order it directly from them. And let them just send it to me to my house in a box, and that's when I would change my oil. But this is the rare, rare, rare occasion you're ever going to hear me say that. But it's a good oil. Redline is a good oil company. I, I will, you know, they are still a poly alpha open. There's no hydro cracked anything. They're they're an independent uh, synthetic oil company. Um, you know, they've been in business for a long time. They're, they they make good products. Um, but you know, it's it's harder to get their stuff than it is, of course, Amsoil. You've got a lot more Amsoil dealers out here than you do uh, Redline. But don't don't let that sway you any way whatsoever. This is one of those cases where you're just going to have to belly up to a different bar. <laughs> uh, 
we like a little different flavor of beer once in a while anyway, you know. So in your case, let's just go with the 10W60 uh, Redline Poly Alpha Orphan with ester, which, you know, prevents the oil seals from getting hard. Um, so I think your best bet is just to go that route. And Matt, listen, uh, you're breaking my heart here talking about another oil oil on the Magic Mechanics show, but in this case, you got to give credit where credit's due. Amsoil doesn't make it because they just would not sell enough of it, I think, is the, is the issue. You've got a very specialized oil for this BMW application. I appreciate your call. You have a great weekend. Thank you, Matt. got about 90 seconds for Jim and Apopka. Go ahead, Jim. Hey, Larry, yeah, and thank you for taking my call. I have a 2019 Ford Ranger, and I believe it's, they call it the ATAC system, which basically controls, it's like a radar that's in the front bumper that controls the, uh, 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 the cruise speed control. control. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's control, uh, speed I, control. I'm getting all kinds of error messages. Pre-collision, uh, as if not available, sensor blocked, amongst other things. Um, is this something I need to go to the dealer or something that can be adjusted by you guys? Um, it, it, it should be still under warranty it being a 19 gem. Um, you know, I hate to, it's like, you know, telling somebody to buy something other than Amsoil. In this particular case, you know, it still should be under a factory warranty. Uh, and, and I'm going to tell you, I would take it back to Ford and let them worry about it. Um, you know, it's, it's just... That particular system, um, we can program it. I mean, we have everything that Ford's got. But it, you know, if, it, if if a part is is failed on it, I wouldn't be able to warranty it out for you. Um, but I appreciate you checking with me, though. And uh, otherwise, if you get it done, give us a holler back and let us know what they did to correct it, whether it was just a program issue or whether the sensor itself had failed. Um, that's going to be uh, an interesting topic for a lot of other Ford, late model Ford owners out there. We appreciate your call. You have a wonderful weekend. Hey, folks, listen, I appreciate everybody tuning in. You listeners, customers, show sponsors are the reason we do the show and I have a job. You can tune in every Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time in Central Florida on 107.3 FM, HD Radio 96.5 FM 2, and AM 580 worldwide at WDBO.com. And click Listen Live or just tell your smart speaker to play WDBO Radio every Saturday at 3 p.m. If you need help with your vehicle, you can always call the Magic Mechanic at 407-629-2661. Visit our website, magicmechanic.com, or you can also leave Email your car questions directly to me, Larry at MagicMechanic.com. And don't forget our new YouTube channel, just YouTube Magic Mechanic, and um, you can hit playback on any of our previous shows. Uh, you can even tune in to the Magic Mechanic YouTube channel and listen to your call uh, coming in. It's hopefully helping other motorists out there as well. Until next week, be safe in and out of your car, and we'll see you back here next Saturday at 3 p.m.